So Lenny Henry, how are you? Hello. So the book, I mean, first of all, how did it come about? Why now? I think when you turn 60, your mind begins to look at the past and you start to package it up and think about how it was. And I, I, I was asked by Faber Faber to write the book and I just thought this is a good time to do this actually, because I've got enough to be getting on with parceling it all up and thinking about what happened in this period. And there's, this book is birth to 20, or if you're a real fan, um, 1958 to Tiz was. So it, it takes in quite a large chunk. Um, it features my mom a lot, a great deal, and her coming to Britain, and the black country, and my birth father, and growing up in some circumstances that could be seen as hostile, although to, for us it was normal. Um, failing the 11 plus, all of that stuff and, and quite seismic stuff that happens to you when you're a kid and uh, and it's there's a lot of joy there's sadness in it um, there's funny stuff as you'd expect from me and there's me winning new faces and about how that turned my life around because the day I won new faces and turned around to face the audience as Frank Spencer is the day that changed my life and it's all in the book and that's why I wanted to write it. Let's go back a bit first of all. Um, let's talk about the home life. It seemed to be such, you know, a loving home, a busy home, a noisy home. Mm. Um, a very Jamaican home. It was, uh, it was like Jamaica in the UK. It was like we'd been twinned with Jamaica. Everybody spoke Jamaican. Everybody ate Jamaican. Food was this high at the dinner table. You had to poke a hole in it if you wanted to see the people opposite you. Um, there, were, there was lots of noise. My mum used to laugh like this. <laughs> at everything um, and I think one of the reasons I wanted to be a performer was because I saw that laugh and I also saw her storytelling skills um, you should have seen Miss Murphy up tone the hair was every which way um, I, I just thought I want to be able to command an audience like that that would be brilliant she worked in factories she made dresses she made cakes she was an organizer she helped people sort themselves out she was very cross when she arrived in Britain in 1957 and there was no Windrush camera crew to meet her. Um, she'd missed it by 10 years. She had a Calypso already. Um, and she was just a, an amazingly strong and powerful woman. And in the book, and I've, and I've done a bit of research since the book came out, it can come across as she, that her being quite austere and quite powerful and quite strong and tough. Um, because she, she hit us kids, as a lot of people did back then. And I don't think of it as a black thing, I think of it as a back then type thing. Sort of everybody seemed to watch everybody's domestic. Get the broomstick, he's running! You know, it was a bit like that. And my mum was like that. There were many frustrations. You know, there was racism back in the day. Keep Britain white on the walls. No blacks, no Irish, no dogs. So if you were a black Irish wolfhound, you were in trouble. Um, and she was here on her own. You know, my, my dad, Winston, was in Jamaica and she came here first. And lots of people did this. Lots of people went to the mother country first to get work and to sort things out. It's an extraordinary time for me as a kid growing up in the Midlands. And, you know, I was bullied at school. Uh, and uh, there was a boxer at our school. He used to treat me as a punching bag. Henry, come and stand over here. Bam, bam, bam. And he'd sort of pretend hit me, but sometimes he would connect. And I'd just be standing there going, why is this guy hitting me? Um, so lots of things to deal with and lots of things that led, I think, to me being who I am. Because I, I, can't, I can't fight. My sister's Kay, hello Kay, it, watching this, going, well, Lynn can't fight. My sister Kay had to go, dun, 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 leave my brother alone. He's my brother. And she would fight, but I couldn't fight. And this one day, this kid was beating me up. And I think I said something like, you must really fancy me because you want to roll around on the ground with me and hug me all the time. And everybody laughed. And I went, that's good. And even though this guy was hitting me, I realized that I had something, I had a weapon. And I just thought, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that. And um, so if this guy said something horrible to me or hit me or something, I'd just say stuff. Oh, here he is again. And the people around would laugh and then say, leave him alone, leave Lenny alone. Lenny's all right. Do you remember the first time you felt that on stage? There was a place in Dudley called the Queen Mary Ballroom. Uh, it's, it's at the top of Dudley Zoo. I used to work at Dudley Zoo. It was an amazing place. Uh, there was a disco on a Sunday night and um, the animals would watch us walk in sober and come out drunk. 
and they're going, we're the ones in cages, what the hell's going on? Um, that night, they pushed me up on stage because they wanted to win the giant Bosco bottle of whiskey uh, that was on offer as a prize, and I won. I did Jail Ass Rock, I did Max Bygraves, here's a funny story. Um, I did Columbo, eh, just one more thing, I did that. And, uh, and I won this big bottle, of, we had this big bottle of whiskey on the table, it was horrible. We gave it away in the end, it was horrible. Well, we could have helped you, really, with your research. There's a couple of clips I want to show you that I've dug out of our archive, okay? okay? This is you showing Bob Warman around your old haunts. No way. Have a look at this. Bob Warman. To come back to the roots of my career, yes, Dudley Zoo, here in the heart of the black country. And I'm going to go back in and find out just where those memories begin. So, if you follow me, we'll see if we can dredge them up. Excuse me, uh, you have to pay admission right now. <laughs> this is where I used to go, Bob, and I'd like, set up the DJ decks here, and I'd be, I'd be here, and they'd set up all the decks, you know, and I'd come up on stage. And I seem very chirpy. You'll be able to see all this stuff and more at Birmingham and Stoke. Birmingham is on the 6th of December. <laughs> <laughs> I'm clearly performing to tell the people that I'm on tour. That's great, actually. It's, we I was very chirpy. We had to find that, but happy memories. Yeah, I was very chirpy then. And, and sort of, um, I'm chirpy now, but I was clearly quite young there. That's a young man promoting a tour there. But um, it's good. I'm, I'm still loving it. I still like what I do. Let's just go back and talk a little bit about new faces, because you mentioned it earlier on. I took Betty out the other day. <laughs> <laughs> I took her to the pictures <laughs> to see Joyce. She won't go near the goldfish now. <laughs> On the first week, I wore new faces, and then I went to Leicester for some reason. I was walking around, and a bus driver, a black bus driver, stopped the bus in the middle of the street, opened his window and said, Lady, you were great on the telly on Saturday night. Do Frank Spencer. And all the people on the bus were going, Oi, I'm trying to get to work here, pal. It was really funny. And the bus stayed there, he literally wanted a Frank Spencer performance in the middle of the street in Leicester. Hello, Betty. And I think I did a bit, and then I said, you better go on now. And he carried on. But um, that's why I knew it was big, because suddenly I was being recognised in places where, you know, I'd go to Derby or something, or Nottingham, and people were, Lenny, ah! It was like a cause of commotion in the street, you know. Um, and that was, that's a big, the power of television. And there was only three channels. There were three channels. So, you know, and I was the only black person on all three of them. So it was seismic, huge in my life. And that instant fame, as you mentioned, and then of course just going from strength to strength through to Tiz Was, which for me was a seminal television moment. One of the biggest regrets of my life is I was, I was nearly on Tiz Was. My brother was on it, he was pulled up by his ears, wow. sat on Alvin Stardust's knee, yeah, and I was too yes. shy to go oh, on God, with him. It was one of the best moments of my life. There was a man with a pig's head playing the piano. There was somebody else wrapped in bandages, a mummy, frightening small children, which I'm sure wouldn't be allowed these days. There was water being thrown everywhere. It was a health and safety nightmare. But it was, for a 17, 18 year old kid, it was brilliant. And I just thought, I want to be in involved with this. Tis was, was the beginning of characters. Algernon, Uki, um, let me hear you say yeah. And um, Katanga, my friends, all of those characters were sort of born around Tiz Was times. And what was really great was just live telly. Just being on live telly was extraordinary. Playing with the cameras, learning about how to be on telly, how not to be flustered. It was a, it was a sort of good learning period for me. Let's talk about the tour. So you start in Birmingham on Sunday. Yes. You take in Leicester, Nottingham, Northampton, Wolverhampton, Coves. I'm going to Dudley. I'm going to Birmingham. There were going to be a a batch of dates in the Midlands because I love being in the Midlands. It's the best thing to be at home and to have people understand what you mean when you talk about the zoo and the Sumeril and snobs and um, all of those clubs and talk about the baggies, the three degrees. They get it. So you don't know, you're, not, you're not really having to kind of make up stuff. What's lovely is you can just talk about a walk down Constitution Hill and the, the crowd in Dudley just start laughing because they know what that walk is. So there's a real, there's lots of familiar touchstones whenever I work in the Midlands and the audience are incredibly supportive. So I always love that. And, and this particular show is about us. 
in the Midlands. What I think you do as an immigrant in, in Britain is you put on different masks to navigate life in this new country, in the mother country. And every Indian, Chinese, Turkish restaurant you go to, you find people who are having to learn how to talk the banter, figure out what the jokes are, learn about the local area, because that's what you've got to do when you're in a new country. Is that, is that integration, as your mum would have called it? As my mum said, you must integrate, mix with the dirty people, talk like them, eat their strange food, try not to box anybody down. You have to integrate, are you worn for teen? And this book, part one of my life story is about my mission to integrate and to fit in with the Dudley people then. Did you learn anything about yourself writing it? Yeah, you do. Somebody said it's like vomiting out your past and separating it into chapters. When you do that, you can look at it and go, oh, okay, that was interesting behavior. I wonder why I was doing that. And from hindsight, you can look back and go, oh, that's why I was doing that. Another one of the, uh, the big things that is important to you is inclusivity and diversity in, in TV and film. Sure. It's something that's, that's massive for ITV. It's something that we're not there yet, but we, I think we're making progress. Um, do you think the industry is making progress and making progress fast enough? I think um, there are certainly efforts from key figures to move the conversation along, but we're still in a position where uh, there are very few people working behind the scenes in television of colour or, you know, the, the, the gender pay gap is slowly being figured out but not to satisfaction yet. Uh, when you go behind the scenes sort of to any show, there are very few people of colour working behind the camera. Um, I still go to meetings where there might be one person of colour in the room. There's, you know, even though women are doing great, I love women in film and television as an organisation, they are very powerful and they are very good, but even whenever I go or see those guy, those people, they're always saying, where are the women, there needs to be more women, the, acti the activism as far as getting women more involved behind the scenes in editorial and producerial positions in television is very powerful and very strong. Um, we've got a long way to go and I think there's nothing wrong with being vo vocal about it, but there needs to be a safe space where people can talk about who they are at work without feeling like they're going to get the sack. You know, there's things to be done. So I'll keep talking about it. We have to be aware of complacency. I gave a speech at uh, the Royal Television Society a couple of weeks ago and there was a whiff of, haven't we done diversity? Haven't we sorted that out? And you know, if you think how long it took to, for women to get the vote or how long it took to abolish slavery, that's the kind of battle we're in to have true diversity, not fake diversity, be the norm. And until people start to realise that, um, we're, we're not going to achieve the things we want to achieve. This is a long-term battle that needs proper structural change. So Lenny, pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much. Thank sir. you. Good luck with the talk. Cheers.